realize I'm the only person standing between you and coffee in half an hour. And I also sense there's a few hangovers in the audience, so I'll keep this brief. Um, as Jim said, I'm just going to set the scene, um, talk about some, some updates in this particular field. And I'm going to focus primarily on, on Syria and Iraq, just because that is the focal point for many of us today. Um, of course, as, as uh, uh, General Dayton mentioned, there are many other areas, and I think actually the number of areas is now increasing again that we need to think about in terms of this issue. Um, so I've got a few facts and figures. I'll talk about the returnee threat assessment uh, in terms of the terrorism threat and some of the challenges that we have in counterterrorism. Now, everybody is now aware, I'm sure, that the estimated current number of foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq is now believed to be somewhere in the region of 25 and 30,000. And that just looking at this graph, you can see how rapidly those numbers have increased. I think what's also important here to note is that those numbers have increased quite significantly even in the past 12 months, despite our best efforts. As many of you, of course, are aware, the primary um, contributors still coming from the Middle East and North Africa, but also very significant numbers coming from all over Europe, as well as Russia, Turkey, elsewhere, uh, and in fact, up to 100 different countries represented worldwide. Now, during this same time period, the last two to three years, of course, we've also seen increasing airstrikes in Syria and Iraq. Uh, coalition airstrikes now total more than 2,500 in Syria and more than 4,500 in Iraq. The result of that, according to public reports, up to 10,000 ISIS terrorists have now been killed. And of course, that includes significant, significant numbers of foreign fighters. For example, it's estimated that up to 20% of American foreign fighters have now been killed in the conflict zone. The other um, impact of those airstrikes, and again, it's estimates, um, in between 10 and 30% of ISIS territory is believed to have been taken away from them. Uh, of course, those figures are disputed. The situation on the ground is constantly changing. Uh, but what I would say is that they are, have certainly been under significant military pressure recently uh, if we look at the Kurdish operations uh, in Sinjar and Ramadi. Um, outside of the conflict of the zone, of course, what we've also seen, I think, which is good news, increasing uh, arrests and successful prosecutions uh, in multiple countries around the world. In addition to that, what we're now seeing is rising numbers of ISIS defectors, people realizing that the, the reality is not what they expected it to be, and of course are now returning, uh, and in some cases are very public in terms of their stories. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that despite all of that, uh, I think that ISIS is still very, very, very capable. Um, and what's happened, in fact, is that they've gained increasing international support, as everybody knows, uh, and in fact their operational tempo uh, has increased in recent months. The, the figure that you see at the top left there is the number of attacks and fatalities attributed to ISIS during a three-month period ending in September of this year. Uh, and according to Jane's analysis, uh, this is a 40% increase based on the previous year. Now, a large part of the reason for that, of course, is these additional so-called Wiliat or provinces outside of their main theater of operations. Uh, and they're particularly active in Nigeria, of course, thanks to Boko Haram, um, with a growing operational tempo in the AFPAC region as well. Um, significant activities, but much less so in other parts of the world. Of course, what we're here to talk about primarily, though, is what is the threat in terms of foreign fighters. People have been part of this conflict and have returned um, back to their countries of origin or regions of origin and are conducting terrorist attacks. Now, we all know from experience, uh, actually what we tend to focus upon is the short-term threat of violence. People who return home and are planning and conducting operations within a short period of time. Um, but we also know from experience that very often the threat unfolds over the mid to long term. And it is not just your violent or ostensibly violent individuals who are, who are a concern. It is also your supposedly non-violent individuals involved in particular in recruitment and facilitation that are also significant threats. With regards to actual uh, conducting of attacks by returned foreign fighters, if we look at the historical record, 
the figures that you come up with are gonna depend on three things. The specific country that you're looking at, the particular time period that you're looking at, and the data or the method that you have for conducting that analysis. That said, estimates range between somewhere between about five and 30% of returned foreign fighters that are likely to be engaged in some form of terrorist plots or attacks, either within their own country or elsewhere, but outside of the conflict zone. I would stress, however, that 30% is very much a high-end estimate of that. Uh, it all depends on your methodology and actually what you would expect the percentage to be much uh, closer to 5% or even less. And we'll see that shortly when we look at the, the record in terms of the current situation. Um, it is important to realize, of course, the historical record can only tell us so much. Um, the current context, I think, is quite different in a number of significant ways. Uh, obviously, the scale and the intensity of mobilization to violent jihad is unprecedented, and that in itself is increasing the risk of, of related terrorist attacks. Um, but I do think that we need to look carefully at the priorities of both Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, very briefly with Al-Qaeda, we know that they have a long track record of doing exactly this, training people up, sending them back to conduct attacks, because it's, it is and has been their priority for a long time. Uh, although I would caveat that by saying I think that Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria is primarily focused with events within their particular area of operations rather than conducting external attacks, at least for the time being. When it comes to ISIS, uh, they historically, of course, have always been focused primarily on local operations and the particular territory that they're controlling uh, it, it, since before they became ISIS. Uh, since September 2014, however, in particular, that has began to change. Uh, you see the quote here from Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, who is the spokesperson for ISIS. If you can kill a disbelieving American or European, especially the spiteful and filthy French, or an Australian, or a Canadian, or any other disbeliever, kill him in any manner or way, however it may be. Do not ask for anyone's advice. Do not seek anyone's verdict. And kill the disbeliever, whether he's civilian or military. Now, what's interesting about this statement actually is that uh, their, their initial calls for action in the West and elsewhere have primarily been actually asking other people, sympathizers, to do their dirty work for them, rather than there being significant evidence of them investing a great deal of time and effort in actually conducting this type of operation. Um, now, that may well have changed the attacks in Paris, it seems, almost certainly would have involved people with combat and training experience from Syria and Iraq, it seems. Uh, and there are allegations, of course, that this has been at least partially directed, if not resourced and supported uh, by ISIS. And in that sense, this may well represent a shift in targeting priorities. Now, the, the third um, point I want to mention here is that the, the director also uh, touched upon is the refugee crisis. Uh, I would actually perhaps differ slightly with his assessment in terms of the related threat. Again, if you look at the historical record, whether it's Algerians in the UK, Somalis in the US, or whatever it happens to be, and if you do the, uh, the analysis there, it works out that far, far less than 1% of any given refugee population which has been involved in terrorism. Of course, there are some but it is by no means representative of the population as a whole. If we were to take uh, the current situation, there are more than 700,000 migrants who have recently come to, to Europe or are currently present in the EU. Um, if ISIS were to send every single fighter that they had, estimated at around 30,000, that would be no more than 4% of that total population. And of course, that's entirely unrealistic. Um, so of course, yes, there will be some terrorists who, who, who take advantage of the refugee situation to infiltrate, I'm sure. Um, but is it your primary concern in terms of refugees? I would suggest not. Now, I want to share with you also the results of a recent uh, study which looked at all of the recent um, plots and attacks within the West from 2011 until June, June 2015. Uh, of course, it is just focused on the West, but, uh, and therefore excludes a lot of other relevant places, but I think it's important for getting an understanding of the, of the level or the probability of the threat which we've seen so far. 
So it's an estimated between four and 5,000 Europeans who've gone to fight in Syria and Iraq. Uh, from 2011 to 2015, there were 69 plots related to jihadist-inspired uh, terrorism. 19 of those plots were actually executed with varying degrees of, su of success. In fact, most were still essentially failures. Uh, 30 of those plots, mostly which took place within the last 12 months, were linked to ISIS. Now, when I say linked, most of them, in fact, were inspired by, with very limited communication online with certain individuals, or in some cases, no communication at all, rather than actually being directed by them. So if we take the two pictures on the right here, the far right, where you see the body there, Omar Abdul Hamid al Hussein. Uh, responsible for the shooting attack in Copenhagen in February 2015, uh, entirely inspired by ISIS. Uh, this was two weeks after he got out of prison, uh, pledged allegiance on Facebook, but had no support or contact with them. And that's far more the level of what we've seen so far. If you compare that, the picture above is from Vivier in Belgium, uh, January that same year. Uh, this was a group, who, in fact, I would suggest we're probably very similar to what we've seen in Paris. A number of individuals who had trained in Syria and Iraq uh, had, had received training, and at the time that they were arrested, were in possession of multiple automatic weapons, explosives making material, police uniforms, GoPro, uh, and GoPro cameras. So we're clearly uh, planning something very, very significant in Belgium. Um, and of course, the, the Paris attacks uh, are an example, it seems, of something very much like that. But those, uh, those cases where there is direct hands-on involvement or involvement of foreign fighters are very much the exception to the rule. If we look again at those 69 plots during that sort of four-year period, 16 of those involved foreign fighters of some description, which works out at around about a quarter of the total number of plots. If you also look at the plotters themselves, there are 120 individuals involved within these 69 plots. Just 11 of those individuals had actually trained and or fought in Syria specifically. If we take that as a percentage of a low-end estimate of 4,000 4, potential foreign fighters from Europe, that's 0.2% or a blowback rate so far of one in 360 foreign fighters. Um, the attacks in Paris, of course, extremely severe in terms of impact, but actually they do not dramatically change the quantitative assessment involved here. The probabilities, the likelihood have not vastly changed as a result of one single incident, uh, regardless of how severe the impact of that was. Um, now, over time, of course, those probabilities will change as we see the threat unfold over the long term. But as I said, if we look at the historical record, it's usually around 5%. Uh, possibly even less than that over the long run. Now, having said and looked at the, the, the threat, I think it's important to take a look at some of the challenges in counterterrorism. also. I think one of the first aspects here is the, the foreign fighter modus operandi. Um, a lot of individuals, in fact, who were not previously known to security services seem to have radicalized very, very quickly and made this decision to travel uh, with little intervention, opportunity for intervention. Um, in addition to that, of course, we have this additional challenge of uh, growing security consciousness. We have people who are taking additional measures to hide the nature of their travel, um, traveling in broken patterns, using hidden city ticketing um, in order to evade uh, or to mask their true destination, and of course, increasing use of encryption uh, and a wider range of different applications. If we take a look at the Paris attacks now, the early reports are that they use PlayStation 4 as a, as a means of communication, so shifting to different platforms constantly. Um, as I mentioned earlier as well, I think we're seeing a growing number of, uh, of destinations opening up again. Of course, we've had areas like Somalia and Afghanistan and Pakistan, which have long been destinations. I think that things focused very much on Syria and Iraq and now are beginning to expand again. Um, certainly the advice for British jihadists was don't come to Syria and Iraq, come to Libya instead. And there have been at least two British nationals who have been killed in recent months in Libya. Um, in terms of our own capabilities, I think one of the, the, the major issues here is essentially border control uh, and whether or not these individuals have the appropriate tools available to them to monitor and intervene uh, uh, in terms of this particular threat. 
For example, most countries do not have the, the means, the capability either to issue or to check fraud-resistant e-passports. Most countries do not make use of passenger name record information. Um, only 12 UN countries have the capability to do real-time um, evaluations with counter-terrorism databases based on advanced passenger information which is given during check-in. Um, so there are some major gaps in terms of the tools and the capabilities available to most border, uh, border control officers. Uh, a related issue here is legislation. Um, of course, uh, since the UN resolution uh, last year, uh, more and more new legislation has been developed, but many countries are still lagging behind. I know BRICS is going to talk about Sweden, and you can t correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe it is still not illegal to train for purposes of terrorism or to take part in a foreign conflict on behalf of a terrorist organization in Sweden, and that's just one example. Um, so legislation is still slow to be developed in many places, and even those who have appropriate legislation, of course, it takes time to build up the investigative and the prosecutorial experience. So simply having legislation in place, of course, in itself is not a, a, a fix or a solution to the problem. Um, information sharing, it, of course, is the number one issue in counterterrorism. I think it always has been and almost always will be. Um, I think it takes place, of course, on a bilateral basis all the time. But if we look multilaterally, the closest thing that we have to a global foreign fighter uh, terrorism database is maintained by Interpol. According to a U.S. bipartisan report released a couple of months ago, that database currently has about 5,000 names on it from a possible of at least 30,000 different uh, suspects. So still a lot of missing information there. Um, and of course, again, if we take a look, we go back to border control. Most people in those positions do not have real-time access to those databases to be able to check people's information against that. Similarly, I think there's some good news and some bad news when we look at Turkey. Um, certainly some uh, vast increases in, in, in border security there, um, and they've developed a no-entry list, which in terms of international sharing, allegedly has about 14,000 names on it, which of course is better than the Interval database in many ways. Uh, but is still missing a lot of potential suspects. So information sharing remains in many ways the number one challenge, I would argue, in dealing with this particular problem. Um, you then, of course, have the, the challenge of the Internet. Uh, the head of British intelligence recently came out and said that online companies, um, social media, and of, of course also um, companies producing apps for smartphones are simply not cooperating in investigations. And again, as I mentioned, with, with the foreign fighters themselves, constantly shifting to new platforms and looking especially for those which use uh, more and more secure encryption. So looking for collaborative engagement with a larger range of, of private sector companies like that, I think is, is another major challenge in this area. And then, of course, you have your final issue here, which relates to soft interventions, so-called counter and violent extremism, CVE. Um, now, the UN, of course, recognized this as, a comprehensive, or, uh, as an important aspect of a comprehensive strategy for uh, countering the foreign terrorist fighter threat, but it's still largely missing in many countries, and even those, even like the UK, which have had this for some time now, there are big questions are about their efficacy and the degree to which they are coordinated with more traditional measures such as intelligence and law enforcement. Um, so looking for ways to fill some of the gaps in our own capabilities, we know that not everybody can be monitored 24-7. We know that not everybody can be prosecuted uh, due to lack of evidence. And so if we're looking for alternative measures to fill some of those gaps in, in law enforcement capabilities. I don't want to finish there on such a pessimistic sounding note. Um, I do think that there has been a, 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 um, very significant progress within a relatively short space of time, especially when you think about all the bureaucratic um, boundaries involved. Um, I think there are more success stories than there are failures. If you look at the number of plots which have been thwarted globally uh, versus the number which have actually uh, been executed or succeeded, um, I think the odds are still stacked ultimately in our favor rather than that of the terrorists. I also think that the growing awareness in terms of gaps and counterterrorism capabilities is, is helping this process. Um, there is more discussion of it 
and certainly wait um, more discussion of how to find um, creative solutions to these problems. Of course, still lots to be done, and that's why we have this COI this week. Uh, we are hoping, of course, to strengthen the PTSS network, but also we want to exchange ideas, best practices, um, and find, hopefully, some, some, some solutions to some of these problems. Um, so with that said, uh, I'm happy to take any comments or questions if anybody has any, but I think that the real interesting and more useful presentations are going to come, of course, from our alumni over the next couple of days.